One of the greatest strategies of the devil is to tell you, you don't have to pray about this. Tell you, you don't deserve to have God's help. Guess what? You don't. You don't deserve it. You point to me one person who deserves to have God's help. And I tell you, they don't deserve it either. That's what grace is for. That's what mercy is for. Hallelujah. And so that is what I want to talk to you about today. This has inspired me. It touched my heart. And then I was like, Lord, am I supposed to give them this word? Or do I just love this story? So early one morning, I grabbed my notebook. I was about to go walking. The Lord said, tell my people this. I am wanting to help them. I am watching to help them. And I am waiting to help them. I didn't really understand it, but I jotted it down. And I went on my walk, and as I walked, the Lord fleshed out the rest of it for me, and so I wrote it for you. So this is a message from the Lord, and I want you to hear it deep inside your heart. I want you to remember what you saw in this clip, that she is doing something nobody else had done. Hallelujah. And although they say it looked easy on her, when she talks about it, she says that last 100 meters was tough. She didn't know if she was going to make it, but what does she look like? That's what God does for you. When you get help from him, Amen. it may be all wrong on the inside. It may be a hard time in your life, something you don't understand. But when you've got grace to help you in your time of need, you got it all. So I want you to open up your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 4. And this is talking about Jesus, the great high priest. And this is what it says starting in verse 14. And that's Hebrews 4. I might skip around a little bit with me. I may get ahead or go back, but just stick with me, okay? Therefore, listen, children of God. Therefore, Hebrews 4 and 14, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hallelujah. If your faith feels weak, if he confesses, feels like it's going to be lost, hold on just a little while longer. Four, because, because we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now because of this, because... He is a great high priest because he ascended to the heavens, because he can empathize or sympathize with us in everything that we go through. He already knows before you go before him. Since all of these reasons, then let us approach, approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Some translations say boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So praise the Lord. Let us approach boldly God's throne of grace with confidence, hallelujah, with boldness, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Hear the word of the Lord, all ye people. So first of all, let me break this down for you. First of all, the Lord is the high priest. The Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest, and he was the high priest of all high priests. And why is this? Well, he just told you in this scripture. First of all, no other high priest has ever been called great. Number two, he not only came, amen, to make sacrifice for us, he went back up. He ascended to the heavens. Hallelujah. No other high priest was called the Son of God. But this high priest is the Son of God. And we can hold fast to our profession of faith because now, hallelujah, according to Hebrews chapter 7, flip over there and look at this with me. Hebrews 7 verse 23 says this. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. And that's what the priest does. The priest stands between you and God. And we all have the same priest, in case you didn't know, Christians. It's not me, not your neighbor, it's Jesus. 
Jesus is the one we look to. We come to God through him because he always lives. He always lives to intercede for them. So I want you to picture this in your mind. Now, the high priest, he was given the the sacrificial system. And through this, he was able to intercede between God and man. Which means he offered up this sacrifice year by year to appease God. Uh Uh-huh. So that God, because God required it of him because it was a picture of Jesus to come. So that man would not be destroyed. Because we are all sinful. If you don't think you're sinful, you don't know you. Huh? We are all sinful and we all need grace. So listen. He always says, so do you know that right now the priesthood of Jesus Christ is still intact? He is still interceding for you. He is still wanting to help you. He is still making plain, hallelujah, your need before the throne of God. He lives. He does. He is not dead, but he lives ever interceding for his children, and he will to the end of the age. Hallelujah. And also this, he is not just someone separated from us. He's been tempted likewise and always, the Bible says, as we have. If you look at Hebrews chapter 2, it says this, verse 14. I'm going to skip ahead to that. It says this. So, the children have flesh and blood. That's talking about us. Hebrews 2 and 14. So he too shared in their humanity. I don't want you to miss that he's the son of God, but I want you to know he was fully man too. He was human. And so their humanity so that his death, by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, and that is the devil. Do you know, hallelujah, That Jesus came and became flesh for you to break the power of the devil. And for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. So he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself, Jesus, say Jesus. He himself, Jesus, suffered when he was tempted. He didn't just brush it off. It was hard on him too. He is able, because he suffered also, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, I just have to say this. You know, we all want to have sympathy and empathy. And we try if we have God's love. But when someone has been through the exact same thing that you've been through, There ain't no replacement for that. So when the Bible tells you he's been tempted likewise always, you should take confidence in that. You should take confidence when you approach him in prayer. He knows where you are and he knows how you can come out. Hallelujah. In fact, some of the early Greeks, they had this idea. And the idea was that God was completely spirit. And if he got contaminated with the material, then he couldn't be perfect. And that, you know, the the spirit was kind of like this unfeeling, uncorruptible, no feelings, no nothing there. But that is not the way Jesus Christ taught us that he is. In fact, the Greek word here that says that he is able to empathize or sympathize depending upon your translation. The Greek word means to suffer along with. Hallelujah. To suffer along with. So the Lord suffered along with us in his humanity so that he could serve as a faithful and just high priest. Hallelujah. The Lord sympathizes with you. He wants to help you through this. And so that's why you get this invitation through the book of Hebrews. Let us therefore come boldly. That's an invitation. Come on boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what does boldly mean? It does not mean arrogantly. God don't owe us nothing. It doesn't mean full of pride. Huh? Hmm. You don't come to God saying, Lord, I'm the best Christian at my church. You should do this for me. That's not the way to approach boldly. That's not what we're talking about. We don't presume anything except for that God is who he says he is and his heart toward us is love. But boldly means this. We can come freely, constantly, without reservation, without thinking he won't understand, 
We can come persistently, often. I, when I was younger, I thought, I need to quit praying about this because the Lord's going to get tired of me talking to him about it. But I was judging him by a human standard. And amen, his ways is high above our ways. And I'm going to say this. He knows. He knows. You don't need fancy prayers neither. You don't need fancy words or a set thing. I remember, uh, 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 and I'm not saying this is the most terrible thing in the, in the world, but pe people, this book became so popular. Um, and it was, uh, and I, 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 I'll say it, I guess, if people get hate me. Get, I get some hate from it, but it's fine. It was called Prayers That Avail Much. And it was a whole list of prayers that you could pray over every situation they could think of they gave you a book for. Now, somebody gave Pastor Gene a copy of it. You know what she did? Threw it in the pile of books and never looked at it again. Why? Because we already got the greatest help to pray that we need. I can pray for things I don't even understand. Hallelujah. I got the spirit to guide my prayers in the word of God. Now, it's not a useless tool. I understand that. But there's a higher place of prayer. And that's the place where you pray with this Holy Spirit's help. Because the Holy Spirit knows how to pray when we don't know how to pray. And there's some things you're going to have to pray in your life. You ain't going to find in no book. You have to find it on your knees and your face in the carpet and crying out for the groanings that words cannot even express. So if you have that book, don't send me no hate mail. Read it and use it and look at the scriptures they use to back it up. That's, that's all right. But you don't need it. You've got an intercessor to help you. Huh? So we come to this throne and this is called the throne of grace. Now, I found this interesting that some of the ancient Hebrew rabbis the Jewish rabbis taught that God had two thrones. They taught that God had a throne of judgment and God had a throne of mercy. And that depending on the situation, you go one or the other, you might get judgment or you might get mercy. Because they found it very hard to reconcile the God who is just and punishes sin and the God that is merciful and forgives the sinner. They had trouble reconciling. Well, people today have the same trouble, don't they? You know why we had that trouble? Because we don't understand grace. But through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, God met through the blood, shed blood of Christ the requirements of his judgment. Hallelujah. And he also through that extended to us mercy. He, what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. That's mercy. When you don't get what you deserve, that's mercy. But I tell you one better. God not only gave us mercy through Jesus Christ, he gave us grace. And that means he gave us what we did not deserve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gave us his spirit. He gave us his self. He gave us his help and he's still giving it to us for those who will boldly approach the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you do, Philippians 4, 6, we quote this all the time. Be anxious for nothing but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard or keep your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we say that like the flip of the tongue, but think about what that says. It means you can take everything, every little thing, every big thing. You can take it to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the greatest strategies of the devil is to tell you, you don't have to pray about this, tell you, you don't deserve to have God's help. Guess what? You don't. You don't deserve it. You point to me one person who deserves to have God's help, and I tell you, they don't deserve it either. That's what grace is for. That's what mercy is for. Hallelujah. The, the Satan will tell you all kinds of things. This is your fault. You messed up. God ain't going to help you. That's a lie, too. It's called the throne of grace for a reason. Hallelujah. And we don't ever approach God on our own merits either anyway. We approach because of Jesus. Hallelujah. So the Lord said, tell them I'm wanting to help them. I'm watching to help them. And I'm waiting to help them. And so I didn't really understand it. I wrote it down really quickly. Got outside before it got too hot. But as I was walking, the Lord began to show me something. And I'm going to tell this to you. Let's close my sermon with it. But first I want you to hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear. 
He's telling his people. See, in Isaiah 41, um, in Isaiah, uh, we're going to go to Isaiah again, but Isaiah, uh, the people were going to depend on Egypt. Kind of like we talked about Jeremiah not long ago. They were going to depend on Egypt's help to help them out of a tough situation of being overcome, but it didn't happen. But the Lord is waiting on them for that. Isaiah 41, 10, do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. Listen, the same thing he said to the Israelites, he's saying to you, I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, John 14, 26. We've already talked about Jesus Christ sending his Holy Spirit, the helper is what it's called by a lot of people. The helper is with you and in you, and because of Jesus Christ, he wants to help you. If he didn't want to help you, he wouldn't give you his spirit. The Lord is watching. Genesis 28, 15 says this. This is when Jacob had the dream at Bethel and he was fleeing from his brother. And the Lord spoke to him through the dream and then he spoke this to him. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Hallelujah. And then we revisit Psalm 121 this week. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going. He is watching. And what does that mean? He is, he, first, he wants to help you and he's watching. What does watching mean? He means he's watching over you. He knows everything that's happened, everything that's coming. He knows. He's watching over your life. And you know, you know if you've been in the Lord, there have been times you should have died. God kept you. Because he was watching over you when you wasn't watching over yourself. So praise his name. Hallelujah. Now, I can say that for myself. I know the Lord kept me. You have to decide that for yourself. But I'm telling you that he keeps you in ways you don't even know. Isaiah 30 and 19. I don't usually use the Amplified Bible, but I'm going to use it this time. This is what I was referring to earlier when I said Isaiah was telling people, don't trust Egypt, trust the Lord. So... The Lord is telling them this in Isaiah 30 and 19. He says this, Therefore the Lord waits. Remember I told you the Lord is waiting? What's he waiting on? Think about this. Therefore the Lord waits expectantly and longs to be gracious to you. And therefore he waits on high. He's looking. He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. And blessed are those who long for him, since he will never fail them. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious unto you. The Lord is waiting for you to turn to that throne. He's waiting for you to seek his face. He is searching out. He's inclining his ear. He wants, he's watching for you. And he's waiting for you to ask for his help. So the Lord, the Lord gave me a, a picture of this, a metaphor for this. Um, now, mainly, amen, I go to the gym now. I don't, I don't have a spotter. I just have to do the best I can. And um, amen, amen, good enough. But when I was young, I had a good friend, and he's the one that introduced me to, to, to weightlifting. And so he told me one day, he said, uh, I wish I would have stuck with it more, but hallelujah, he said, we're going to spot each other. And I was like, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. What's he talking about? I, I figured it out pretty soon, though. And so the Lord began to show me he is like a spotter. And this is the way to explain it to you. First of all, the duties of a good spotter. Now, what's a spotter? A spotter's there to help assist you while you're lifting, especially free weights, right? It's really free weights because you can make some mistakes and hurt yourself. So the first thing is that a good spotter has to be there. He has to want to spot you and do his job. Because if he don't want to be there, you're going to show up to work out, he ain't going to be there. And I'm not the brave kind. I don't try stuff as hard if somebody ain't watching over me. Hmm? But the Lord is watching. He's right there. Well, you about to lift that weight, you about to do that thing, he's right there, he's on top of you. You don't see him, you may not always see him, but he is there. Now, the second thing a good spotter has to do is watch. Now, if they're standing there, they're looking all over at everybody else, looking at the cute girl doing the squats, what, that ain't going to help you. They got to watch you. 
they got to watch you because they got to see when you begin to falter. Very important. There's other skills that they have to have, like knowing when to put your hand placement, the, the area of movement and all that, but that doesn't really work for our metaphor. I don't want to go that deep, but I want you to know they have to watch. Hmm? They have to watch. And they wait. They're watching and they're waiting. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for when you need the help. Because if a spotter's just going to be there and lift the weight for you every time, what good is that going to do you? Not a dang but a good. But they have to wait till you really need the help. And that's exactly what God does too. I remember when I was working out one time with my friend, um, Earl. Y'all remember him? Some of you do. I was doing the incline dumbbell chest press. And I was getting toward the last rep. And I got about halfway up. I was like, that's it. No more gas in the tank. It started to sink back down. And then the most amazing thing was that he just took two of his fingers, put on the edge of my wrist, just a little bit of pressure, just a little bit of help. I was able to finish that rep and then the next one and be done with the set. Just a little bit of help. I was amazed. I remember being, I remember it after all these years. Just a little bit of help at the right time helped me get through. But it wasn't too much help. Now see, this is what God showed me. Sometimes Christians, they start asking for God's help. But what they really want ain't God's help. They want God to take the whole thing off them. Now listen, <laughs> if, you, if you fail good enough, God will help you. He'll help you, right? There's sometimes the spotter has to rescue, right? But most of the time, that's not, that's not it. They let you do as much as you can do Y'all hear what I'm saying? There's a spiritual message in what I'm saying to you now. They let you do as much as you can. Because if you don't train to failure, if you don't train to failure, you ain't going to grow. If you don't put everything you got, you won't grow in your muscles. And if you don't put everything you got in your faith, you ain't going to grow either. So he don't just step in there and take it all away. He gives you enough help at the right time. To help you make it through. Because he is a good spotter. Hallelujah. If you're hard. If you're hard. It feels like you're going to go down. And the weight's going to crush you. God's there. He knows the right time to step in. He knows the right time. To give you just enough help. And he knows the right time to take the whole thing off. He knows. You don't have to explain it or tell him. But you have to approach that throne of grace. You have to come before him. You have to cry out to him. You have to stay there. You have to stay there. In that covenant. In that covenant of coming to him boldly because of Jesus Christ. Not because of you. Don't get it confused. You ain't, get, you ain't so good. Jesus is good. And when you come to him, he's going to help you. He's going to be with you. He's going to, and you know. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this. I, I've experienced some muscle growth in the past few months. And it, it, uh, when you figure out, let me tell you how you know, and this might be for more for win, men, men for women, but some of you women lift. If it don't hurt when you get done, some, if you ain't sore the next day, you ain't, you ain't doing nothing. You ain't doing nothing. And listen. If, if you don't, if, if your faith don't never feel tested and you don't ever feel bruised by what you, you ain't doing no good. You ain't growing. Stretch yourself out there. Let me tell you what else. When you're lifting, if it don't take no effort, you ain't doing nothing either. Huh? If you can lift that thing 30 times and not even break a sweat, you just go home. Go home. Hard things make us stronger. Hard battles make you stronger, child of God. The Lord, ain't, if, you, if you're, listen, you ain't perfect, I ain't perfect, but if you're trying to serve the Lord and stick with him, he's still with you. And let's be honest, there's been times we weren't we really serving the Lord. He still kept us. He still was good to us. He still preserved us. God is for you, not against you. God is for you, not against you. He wants to help you. He's watching over you. He's waiting 
for the right time because he wants your faith to be as strong as you want it to be and greater. Amen. He wants it to be strong. And you know, when you see those big guys at the gym, muscle, that muscles got muscles, let me tell you what. It didn't happen in a day. It didn't happen in a week. Most time it didn't happen in a year. It happened constantly, constantly, constantly. Listen, for you to have faith and hold on to your profession, you're going to have to constantly, constantly, constantly go before the throne. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, Lord Jesus, touch the people, Lord. Strengthen them, Lord Jesus, in their inner man, Lord Jesus. And let them know, Lord, that this is a word from you, Lord, through, a, through an imperfect mouth of clay. But, Lord, even if I didn't get, deliver it as, as good as you'd like, Lord, forgive me. But, Lord, let us stick with them this week, Lord. Let them hear this word and let them begin to approach you, Lord, day after day, time after time, that they can find help in their time of need. In Jesus' name. We agree together and we say amen.